Coming up next, an interview with one of the most underappreciated vocalists of the 80s and the early 90s on the story behind his British duo's first major hit. In 1985, it hit the top five and it was a, a pseudo, a new wave dance pop soul hit that will take you right back to the neon decade. Uh, in fact, Freddie Mercury of Queen was a fan. Stories coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember playing with Star Wars, G.I. Joe, He-Man, Barbie, whatever, you're going to dig this channel. It's, it's a time machine that takes you right back to those wonderful moments of your youth. Make sure that you subscribe, uh, hit the subscribe button below, and when you do, uh, check the box. That way you get all of our videos. If you'd like to have more videos or become an honorary producer and uh, where we give you a credit on our YouTube channel, look us up on Patreon in the description below. And our coupon code for our merch today is the word VINTAGE. That'll get you 10% off at professorofrock.com, including Vintage Years Collection, which I'm wearing today. So I'm excited to bring you another episode from our series, Revelations. This is where featured artists reveal rare stories about their biggest songs, along with fascinating insight from their career. On this installment of Revelations, we have our old friend Peter Cox, the lead voice behind British new wave soul group, Go West. He and bandmate Richard Drummy composed We Close Our Eyes, an 80s classic together. had one of those irresistible synthesizer hooks, and it was the first single off their self-titled debut album. The music video that was directed by the famed team of Godly and Cream, who directed some of the most iconic videos of the 80s, including the atmospheric, uh, the heart-wrenching, every breath you take. There was actually an Australian television show called Countdown, where artists would talk about their thoughts on you know, bands, new bands, different songs. And legendary Queen frontman Freddie Mercury was quite impressed with this band. He predicted that they would be very successful. If you remember, Go West would really blow up even more in 1990 when their Martin Page co-write would become one of the most memorable songs of the year uh, from the Pretty Woman soundtrack. We Close Our Eyes, that would have a nice chart run too. It went to number five in the UK charts, went to number five in the American dance charts, and it also went to number 41 in the Hot 100. Now, Peter is gonna tell us the story of all of this next. Now, as we go into this interview, I do wanna thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. These are the only glasses that I'll ever wear. Make sure to treat yourself to a pair of Zennies today. This is where you design your own colors, shape, size, Everything. Check it out at zenny.com. Here's Peter Cox with the story. You released your self titled debut, and I want to talk about the irresistible We Close Our Eyes. I always loved that song. I remember the first time that I heard it. I was a kid listening to pop radio. I grew up in a small town in Idaho, not a lot to do, and the radio was my window to the world. We could get MTV at some places. Some of my friends had cable, so I could see that, but I remember hearing we close our eyes and just being blown away by it. The song went to number five in the UK and number four in New Zealand, number nine in Italy, number eight in Australia, number 11 in Ireland. So it, it started to go global and then it was number five on the dance charts here in america and then it also went to number 41 on the billboard charts but number 33 in the cash box charts i always looked at both charts i was kind of one <laughs> of those music geeks you know but i yeah. love the synth hook and that's what just grabs you from the beginning how did that come about synth hook and then the song well, when I was writing with Richard, the kind of music that we were listening to was typically West Coast America. Michael McDonald, Steely Dan, those kinds of artists. And so the original version of We Close Our Eyes was a much more mid-tempo version of the song with no synth hook that you're mentioning. 
And when we started to work with our friend Gary Stevenson, who produced the first album, one of the, the, the simplest but the biggest effects that Gary had on all our material was that he encouraged us to accelerate the tempo of everything to the point where the song still worked before the, the faster tempo ruined it completely. So in that way, we close our eyes, accelerated. Uh, I had another look at the bass line, obviously influenced by Michael Jackson's Billie Jean. Everyone hides one desire. But when it comes to the synth hook, uh, the other, the fourth member of the five core guys who made that first Go West album, Dave West, who was the synthesis who dialed up all the sounds. And uh, I realized with the benefit of hindsight, what an enormous part he played in the sound of the band. Because what was great about working with Gary and with Dave was that they would listen. So you were never in a situation where you were having this or that overdub forced upon you. We would talk about every detail of, you know, the lengths of the notes and so on and so on and so on. So we had just got hold of a PPG wave synthesizer. It was quite the new thing, as I remember at the time. And as you say, someone said, you know, what the song needs at the beginning is something that's going to grab people's attention. Richard came up with, ba -da -da -da, and then the rest of the line was my counterpoint to that. Thereafter, Dave uh, built up that sound, overdubbing synth after synth after synth. That was the technique back in the day. Uh, and Gary played some guitar. Uh, I played some of the simpler guitar on the first record, but we also found that 24 guitars is not necessarily bigger than four or three or two guitars, uh, but it's a learning process. But that's kind of, that's how the, the synth hook at the beginning of We Close Our Eyes came about. Yeah. Yeah, Billy Jean. It's funny. The last couple of days, I've been talking to different artists, and uh, you know, Billy Jean kind of lifted, or Michael Jackson told uh, Hall and Oates. Uh, I was talking to John Oates the other day about, I can't go for that. Yeah. How Michael Jackson had told him that he loved to dance to that song, and kind of lifted some inspiration. And then a couple of weeks ago, we we're talking about State of Independence, Donna Summer, and how how Michael Jackson was influenced by that as well. So everybody takes from everybody um, influence. Excellent. It just continues uh -huh. on and on. Inside. I always was interested in the lyrics. As a kid, I, I would get out the lyric sheet if the CD or the tape had them. But I always wondered on, we close our eyes, we never lose a game. Imagination never lets us take the blame. I was wondering what it meant. What inspired the lyrics and what was behind that? That was one of the, the more intelligent lyrics. When I look back at some of the lyrics on that first album, uh, one of the downsides of writing with a collaborator where each person involved wants to have maximum control uh, you know, it's, it becomes a bit of a head-banging sort of process. Um, but we close our eyes. It's it's about uh, escaping into your imagination when things are not going right. It's you know, I think uh, when you know that, I hope that the lyric makes some kind of sense. As I say, when I look back at some of the lyrics on that first album, uh, they're <laughs> not all. I'm not. I'm not proud of all of them in the same way. Well, it makes sense. I mean, we can talk to strangers. We're burning with the spark and the we are tigers. We are tigers in the dark. What I love is like the syncopation of the sung lyrics in the chorus is really powerful because it starts, it almost feels like it speeds up. Wig da da da. How you syncopated that. That was really great. There's a kind of a punch behind it. What do you remember about recording it and, and how that came about arranging the song? Well, I think we had the melody uh, and the lyrics um, 
before we went into Chipping Norton with Gary and Dave, I think that their involvement would, I think if they hadn't thought the song was strong, they would have definitely let us know. Um, but by that time we had, you know, Gary uh, was still in with his parents in an apartment and uh, they were really supportive. And so a lot of recording, all the BBs to call me, as I remember, were done in a bedroom in that apartment. Gary was kind of uh, a whiz already with an eight track reel to reel machine that he had with his own band. So at least in terms of the technological side of things, Gary and Dave were way ahead of us and they brought that to the party. Um, but in terms of recording, we close our eyes. I remember that we started and all of us felt that these five days at Chipping Norton were, gonna, were an opportunity that we hadn't had we weren't in a position to have been able to afford five straight days in the 24 track studio before that time. So we got in there on the first day. We were, we attempted to record the song with live drums and, uh, and Gary is a very, he's very particular about timing. And of course, as we know, that was an era where machines kind of ruled in a way. So what I'm getting at is that the whole of that first day, was a bust really. At the end of it, we didn't feel as if we had the basis for the track. Uh, and uh, because we felt we wasted the first 24 hours, I think we all went to bed for like three and a half hours or something and got up again at the crack of dawn. Right, what are we gonna do to fix this situation? Uh, thankfully, we were young enough that we had the energy that we could do that. And we started again from scratch. We pretty much recorded the rhythm tracks and most of the overdubs in that period of time. And as I remember, I re-recorded the vocal somewhere else later on. But the basis of it was there. So while they are sometimes referred to as demos, they were really the masters, but for a few overdubs. Sometime after that, Freddie Mercury was on a Australian television show. It was called Countdown. And he talked about the record and talked about you guys and said he loved, he was really impressed with it. And he thought you guys were going to be really, really big. One of their clips, actually, and heard a couple of their songs. I think they're, they're going to be very, very big. Right, I, I do. I heard that more recently. I mean, that's just, obviously, it's just incredible to, to know that someone as beloved as Freddie still is would have nice things to say. And oddly, there's a connection because John's wife... Julie worked in the Queen office uh, for many, many years and knew all those guys really well. And I, obviously, I'm still in touch with Julie. So, yeah, it's, you know, it's, there's connections there. But, yeah, obviously, really flattering and it means a lot to, to get that kind of positivity. There was a time when, in the UK, Robert Palmer was saying nice things about me, particularly as a singer. When you've been a passionate music lover your whole adult life, and these, this is a guy whose records I had bought and listened to, and to have someone that we respected that much saying such nice things about me on TV, and I could watch and see him saying those words, that was, yeah, I mean, it's just amazing, amazing. The music video, Godly and Cream, which was uh, huge at that time. I'm speaking of the police. They, Every Breath You Take, one of the most famous and cinematic music videos ever. And I noticed that you've got a, a little wooden mannequin in the background there. Yeah. Yeah, That's yeah, a nice yeah. touch. <laughs> We recorded the first Go West album in a basement studio um, in London. Uh, we had a great time. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but it wasn't an expensive studio. And when there were five of us in the control room with a couple of keyboards, you couldn't move in that place. Um, and uh, the reason I mention that is because, as I, I want to say, the first album cost around, I don't know, 85,000 pounds in total to record. And and the video for We Close Our Eyes cost £125,000. Oh, so the cost of the video 
was substantially more than the entire cost of making the album. But as you rightly say, Goggy and Cream were just so hot at that time. So hot, in fact, that when Chrysalis approached them to do the video for uh, We Close Our Eyes, my understanding of that process under normal circumstances is that the directors would provide a storyboard to the people that were going to hire them to give them some idea of what they could expect at the end process. But in this instance, Chrysalis was so thrilled to get Godly and Cream to say yes, that they didn't even, no one had any idea what that video was going to look like when we all went in to make it. And in actual fact, because I've worked with Godly and Cream at least once since then, and I don't think they did either. I don't think they did either. They were confident enough to go with their instincts. Uh, and uh, yeah, they, they just let what would happen happen. And if, if, you, if a person is familiar with the We Close Our Eyes video, there are numbers that go past in the background while the performance is going on. And as I understand it, that is just a part of the editing process that wouldn't ordinarily be there in the end result. But they just looked at it and they thought, that looks cool, we'll leave it in. So, yeah. I also remember that was one of the hardest day's work I ever did that, that day in that studio. It was a January or February in London. It was snowing outside and then we're in this studio and uh, I didn't know anything about the wrench or the way I was going to look in the video until the day that we arrived at the studio. I saw this wrench on the side. I was like, what's that, what's, what's, what's that going to be for? And they said, yeah, we're going to give that to you as a prop. And, you know, listen, they are very smart guys. And they knew that Richard and I had zero performing experience in front of a camera. That's for sure. So the first shot was um, the camera was in front of me about six feet away and they were on either side of the camera out of shot obviously shouting instructions at me do this move this lift it up you know so it so obviously the wrench was much heavier than you might imagine <laughs> so my mother my spindly body was immediately pumped up to the max as far as it could go <laughs> throwing that thing around And they just worked me until I just couldn't lift it over my head any longer. Then they'd open the doors and let the cold air in. Richard would come in and do a shot. Uh, and then back to, back to me in front of the camera. So that's how we did that video. It's a memorable video for sure. Uh, that's, I love music videos in the 80s because I, I feel like people just were a lot more creative because there wasn't as much technology. And so they were forced yeah, to really so. do that. Really yeah, imagine. Maybe so. I mean, again, at the end of that day's filming, we hadn't seen any uh, wooden dolls, as I remember. So I didn't know what that was going to look like until I think they did a further day of filming without Richard and me. So they could do the stop motion with the dolls. And we, uh, we naively said to them, so, can we come along to the edit? And they said, no, no, you can't. <laughs> so that was very disappointing. But uh, obviously, the job got done. Uh, it was, as I remember, in the early days of MTV. And obviously, we couldn't be in America there. We, I don't think we even had a performing band at that time. So in order to introduce us to a US audience uh, with something that, uh, had the Godly and Cream name behind it and so on and so on. It did a good job, yeah. No what did you think when you first heard your song on the radio? Do you remember the first time you heard Absolutely. Close Our Eyes? Tell me about yeah, that. Yeah, clear as day. We had a, well, Richard had a really old, beaten up yellow Fiat. Uh, the driver's door was tied on with a piece of rope and it had a moonroof. <laughs> So it, rather than undo the, the rope, typically he would just get out of the top of the car, uh, really un-rock and roll, very uncool. But we were riding in that car over Putney Bridge in London and the song came on the radio. And we just we had to pull over. It's not a place where you can really stop uh, in traffic normally, but we just had to pull over and just 
have that moment of, wow, they're on the radio. So yeah, I remember that really well. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Peter Cox and about Go West and this 80s classic. What do you remember? What are your fondest memories of this band, this song, and also of the year 1985, if you can remember. Let's talk about it below. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe and uh, become a permanent part of our channel, our community. Make sure to check us out on Patreon for even more content and our Vintage Years collection, all about keeping the music alive. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Stay safe.